Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for watching the film and sticking around for the Q&A. Um, I just wanted to quickly uh, say a couple of things. As I mentioned earlier, um, I'd really like this to be a conversation with the community watching. So please place your questions in the Q&A box and I'll call on you individually. Um, when I call on you, I'm going to transfer you over to the panelist side and you're welcome to turn on your video at that point if you like so that uh, we can actually um, see you. Uh, but if you're not comfortable with that, just turn on your mic and feel free to ask your question live. Um, and just to very quickly introduce our guests and uh, uh, Chan, I'm sorry, I'm gonna just kind of move through your bio a little quicker um, than the full bio. Um, but uh, let's start with the director of the film, D. Chanson Berry. He's a modern day Renaissance man, a filmmaker, a pro prolific songwriter and painter. Um, his career has moved seamlessly through the movie and music industries. Uh, he started his career in New York radio. Um, after five years in radio in the Bay Area, uh, Chan moved to Los Angeles uh, to work for the Walt Disney Studios Feature Film Financing Division. Uh, he's written and directed music videos for artists such as Chaka Khan and Dionne Warwick. Uh, he's worked in television as an executive producer and director, and he's directed independent films and documentaries, such as A Different Shade of Love, My Father's Music, Jazz, and The Black Line, a profile of the black male parts one, two, and three. Um, he's currently working on several film and TV projects for Urban Winter Entertainment uh, with business partner Mark Cohen. Uh, our second guest is Reverend Dr. Michael Elam who received his doctorate in ministry and interfaith theology from the New Seminary, where he was also ordained as an interfaith minister. He's a graduate of Union Theological Seminary, where he received his uh, uh, master's of, of uh, sorry, MDiv, I, I have to admit. <laughs> master's of Divinity. <laughs> master's of Divinity, thank you. And systematic theology, I should have been prepared for that. Um, he's a lecturer and educator who's lectured at various seminaries, including Drew University, New York Theological Seminary, Union Theological Seminary, Howard University School of Divinity, Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Divinity, and New Brunswick Seminary on the topic, The Genesis of Sodom and Gomorrah, a same gender loving theolo a theological reflection. Uh, Reverend Dr. Elam ministers in several capacities at St. Paul Community Baptist Church as the current um, director of Wounded Healers, a spiritually based 12-step recovery ministry and serves on the MAAFA ministerial team. Reverend Dr. Elam serves as a resident theologian at Sage Harlem, a senior program for elder LGBT people of color. So thank you both so much for joining us uh, for this discussion. And uh, I, I, uh, I have to say, Chan, all of the films that, that you've presented at, uh, with us um, always revolve around things that people really don't discuss uh, often within their communities and talking about sexuality and its role in the black church is definitely a topic that seems to be something that most people are not open to sharing with, um, with the world, even if those conversations happen in private. So, I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit about the genesis of this and um, really what inspired you to want to tell a story that is really not, I guess, seen or heard about, um, you know, outside of closed doors. Um, first of all, can you guys hear me now? Yes. Okay, okay good. Okay. Thanks again for, for having me uh, and having the film and having Michael on. Alex, you top class. So, uh, and thank you, USC, top class. Um, the reason why I did the film, because I grew up in the black church in New Jersey, uh, in Newark, East Orange. Uh, I went to Baptists and, and uh, Presbyterian churches. And uh, my uncle was a Baptist minister, and I have a couple of ministers in my family. And I used to watch and listen as a little boy um, all the things that went on um, in the pews and in the pulpit, because I was running around the church and uh, I had access to the, the pulpit uh, at times, and I was always in the choir uh, with my aunts or my mom, you know, standing by them, uh, you know, trying to trying to sing the words of the of the, of the hymns. 
Um, but I saw a lot and heard a lot. And uh, as I grew older, I would hear more stories about sexuality and how people were being treated, how women were being treated, how men were being treated, how little boys and little girls were being treated in the black church. But also, I had a friend of mine, one of my best friends, who was Catholic. And I would hear stories about what's happening around the corner in the Catholic church, you know, also with the priests uh, and little boys and, and that sort of thing. And after a while, I just decided when I became an adult, you know, I only do films that really hit me here in my heart that I feel. And I felt that something needed to be said out loud. I could have called a lot of people to test on this one. Uh, I had people come to me and said they wanted to tell their stories. And the stories that they told me off camera would probably devastate and ruin at least four or five churches, major churches in this country. And um, I didn't do that. I could have. I still have the stories, but I won't let them out. I know what they are, but I just can't do that. So I decided to take the route down the middle where I would let the audience decide what they wanted to do and what they wanted to hear and how they wanted to become or change their mind or, or you know, change their feelings about the black church or even you know, what they could do to help the black church. Now, we're not talking about all African-American churches, of course. We're not talking about all preachers. But there are a few preachers still in this country, small churches and large churches, who are still doing damage to people who look like us. And this damage has boys, little boys and little girls growing up half themselves, not whole. And where's the Christ in that? Where's the love in that? Where's the humanity in that? Where's the Bible, the Torah, or the Quran in that? That's what I question. That's what I question. So that's the, the, the brother who, who was in, in Atlanta, Eddie, who was a pastor. He was the catalyst for me just going in and just like, you know what? enough of this paying boys off to have sex and being quiet that sort of thing and passing women along like they were you know dolls enough 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 uh reverend i'm curious if you can tell us a bit about your gut response to chan coming to you with this idea because uh you're of course in the film, so it's uh, it's something that's going to be seen, discussed, debated. Um, what what did you think um, the film was going to be? Uh, is this the film that you were expecting? I, I'm just curious to know a little bit, um, you know, about your 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 perspective on it. Well, um, I think I had been doing some of this work on sexuality and theology. That was my background in um, Unity Theological Seminary. And I, because of my lecture series, I wound up at a conference and I did a presentation at the conference of my lecture. And someone who was in the audience said, I, you need to talk to so-and-so, so -and -so. you need to talk to, to my friend, Chance and, Chance and Barry. So I said, great. So we started emailing, we started emailing, started talking. And of course, you know, you, at that point, you were filming, so you're getting different pieces, you're getting different areas of, um, of the film. You don't see the whole thing. And this is my maybe the third time I'm seeing this, right, Chan, I think? Yeah. This is my third time I'm seeing this. So when the first time I saw it, I was like, oh my God, first of all, um, if you're in the black church experience, you, the film has heavy hitters. So as a person who had experienced a failed suicide attempt mm -hmm. to be in a film with heavy hitters in the black church experience, you got to realize where I've come from and where I am now. So it has put you, you uh, the film is, is the film is a demonstration of my own evolution, actually, because I wasn't Reverend Doctor 
when this film was being done. I wasn't a Reverend Doctor when I t- almost committed suicide. It was through this process of this energy that says, you have a story to tell. The world needs to hear the story. You would be telling the story, and now the story is being told in a different format. Um, there's, of course, people that are interviewed in the film that have uh, different, uh, you know, contradictory points of view from some of the other people. And um, I think it's very important that you included that. Uh, but Chen, I'm curious if you can talk about getting that variety of perspectives and what that process was like, getting them to want to participate. I mean, if, um, you know, if you're gonna hear voices in defense of something or in opposition to it, um, how much of that full conversation were they aware of and, and did you present to them? Well, I needed to start the film off with somewhat equal foot footing. It's the history of sexuality in the Bible, in the Quran, you know, uh, and, all, and all the rest of the religious books. So I started off with talking to a rabbi, to a Catholic priest, to an African-American minister. And I had them explain from their perspective what sexuality meant from their books. And I thought that was the best way to start it because it, the, the thing about sexuality is not just a black thing in the black church thing. It's a church thing, period. It's a temple thing, period. It's a, you know, it's where, wherever you have a gathering of people, you have a person in power who has, who has power in the pulpit. There's always going to be some type of sexual energy going back and forth, uh, whether it be a woman or a man in the pulpit, matter of fact. But when you have a person who's in leadership and the light is on them and they're talking about God, that makes them very, very attractive to some people. So in order to be true to my heart and my calling on this film is that I needed to, to have the audience be exposed to all of the different points of view, not just the black minister's point of view. And so when I came to them, these, these, these people, and unfortunately, three other people in this documentary have passed on. And I start off with, with, Reverend, with uh, you know, uh, Pete, who was uh, out of New York, who was a priest. Um, Pete passed away. Uh, last year, unfortunately, and um, Pastor Meyer Britt pa- passed. Britton passed away. Is that correct? Uh, uh, three, 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 three years ago or four years yeah, ago? Three years ago. Oh, yeah, about three years ago. Three years ago, and I think there was someone else, another minister in in um, in um, Nashville that passed away also, and in filming this. But I was able to get these special people to tell their special part of the story and give their, uh, their power and grace to it. So I was very, very happy with that. But I, I needed to, to, to open it up like that and then come to where the church, where the black church was. Mm. I'm gonna quickly ask a couple of things from uh, the audience that they, they wanted me to just ask uh, directly. <clears throat> and they're sort of related. Um, did you receive any significant opposition from uh, any- <laughs> <laughs> Uh, did you receive any death threats? <laughs> you know, very good question. Um, my family and my close friends were like, dude, listen, you've done some things with some other documentaries, but this one, you might want to backpedal on, you know, on this one a little bit because you're about to start some, some stuff and ruin some people, people's lives. And I said, no, I'm not. I have no fear, no worry with this at all, because it was given to me by a person, place, and thing that's going to protect me. I was not worried at all. There were some protests uh, when the first screening, pr- the premiere screening happened in, at Rutgers University in North New Jersey. And um, the article came out in the Star Ledger, I believe, the North paper, and um, on a Friday. And I think the, the screening was on a Monday or Tuesday. 
but I had heard that there were pastors in New Jersey and New York had gotten together and decided that they were having a big meeting to boycott my film without even seeing it first. Mm. And I was telling, I was hoping that they would. I was really hoping that they would. Because, you know, sometimes we as a people open our mouths before we open our eyes. And that's a problem sometimes that some of us have. And they would have been surprised to know that what they thought was in it wasn't in it. Well, but it says a lot, it says a lot about what, 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 what did they think was in it. Well, you know, like I said, I, I had gotten one thing. <laughs> I had gotten some real stories about some real pastors around the country, from from Dallas, uh, New York, Chicago. LA, Newark, New Jersey, and New York and Harlem. I've gotten some real stories. And I could have blasted, like I said, all those people and it would have been backed up by more people about some of the things that happened. Uh, about a pastor in, in Washington, DC also. But I didn't do that. Because I didn't, I didn't feel that it was necessary to go that far to tell the story that I wanted to tell, to talk, to talk about. I thought people would be able to read between the lines, and plus, they know who these people are. Well, you, you're you're obviously not naming names, um, no. but you are talking about some some issues, particularly the the uh, relationship between the LGBT community and the church, which seems, you know, to to continue to be a very polarizing. Um, uh, problem in, in, in terms of the, I guess, the interpretation of the Bible, uh, at least as it's explained by some of the, uh, the, the people that you have in the film, on the basis of the topics that you're discussing, were you finding significant backlash? Yes. Um, <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I did point, counterpoint, Point, counterpoint throughout the film. And, you know, when you get down to, to the Bible Belt in the South, and you're talking to ministers, preachers, and pastors, male, predominantly black male pastors, and white male pastors, uh, who are probably uh, over a certain particular age, they have a certain point of view that they uh, will stick to and have stuck to for, for many, many years. And this is what they believe. And then you have another section of new ministers and pastors who are younger, who come with a different point of view. Um, going back to one of, the, one of the deepest things that was said to, in, the, in the documentary is that the question was, who put a back cover on the Bible? That's one of the deepest questions in this documentary for me. And it says a lot about who we are or who we think we are as so-called Christians or, or people of faith. That God has stopped working now. Miracles are not happening now. The devil is not moving now. Things are still happening. We still have prophets, but who are they? They may be around you. They may be around me, but they're not writing anything. To me, the Bible is an ongoing living testament of, of, of humanity and spirit. Why? That's a very good question. Why does it have a back cover when things are still happening? Look at us now in, in the world. God hasn't left. The devil hasn't left. The plague hasn't left. But what now? I know things were foretold, but what about the stories now of spirit and spirituality? I'm curious, Reverend, if this, the making of this film was making waves throughout its production uh, amongst people that you knew or the church community, if, if there was a, a, a sort of sense of either 
that this conversation was long overdue or that this conversation should not be had? Uh, what, what sort of, what was the, I guess, what was the general approach or attitude towards it from people that you know? Well, people that I know who, who, um, who I talk about it or have seen it, we are in a, um, it's a, we're in a time where there are more conversations or uh, more lived stories. And, um, and the old guard is getting older and the new generation is coming about with a different lens and a different perspective. We have to remember there was a time where black LGBT people were, did not go to seminary. Now they're going to seminary and they're going in and having these conversations and these challenges because they have the backup. Where now there are the media, the, the middle generation is looking at it like, well, I need to look at that. You know, I need to look. We've seen some, I've seen some preachers who have actually made the change to look at the work because the work is approached from a different lens a different, and a different angle. I never approached it from an emotional perspective. I never, but for my own, because I understand the black church, there are certain words I don't use. Because I understand the black church, you will never see me walk around with a pink flag or rainbow colors because I know what that triggers for me. But however, I can have a conversation about humanity. I can have a conversation about showing up and showing up in spaces and places. And I ha can have a conversation about human sexuality. I have the background, I have the knowledge, I have the books, I have the writers, I got the degrees to back it up. It's like, this is, this is the conversation we need to have. Now we can go all kinds of directions, but we now, have a, we now have a space and a place where we can have these conversations based upon some um, work that has been done and stories that have been told. I was very clear um, when I went to uh, uh, this, my church, um, I Wounded Heels Again is a 12 step recovery program, and I went because I was a codependent. And we're all exchanging stories. And then I found out, hey, that was suffering from just my own anxieties about certain things. And I came out the closet in the ministry in the Black Baptist Church. And you expecting, I was expect, I didn't know what to expect. What I got was what I've been looking for all my life was, okay, was love and love. And now look where I am because I was embraced with my story was embraced and who I am and my totality of who I am was embraced. So I credit uh, a ministry that really focused on, when people really focus on love, you don't know where people can go and how they can grow. I think that's what true salvation is. True salvation is um, uh, saving people from doing damage to themselves and living their life fully, whatever that means. Um, I'd like to welcome over some people from the audience. And uh, th I know that uh, she doesn't have a question, but more of a statement. And I just really miss being around uh, my colleague uh, Cookie, so I cannot wait to see your face. I'm going to promote her to panelist. And Cookie, you can turn on your mic, you can turn on your video. Uh, you don't have to, but it would be great to see you. Hi. <laughs> um, I don't think what I'm on has a video that I can, a camera on it, but oh, no. my mic is on. Is my mic on? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't a, um, a question. It was just that I think that he should be congratulated um, for making this film. It should be shown to pastors all over because they seem to be afraid of afraid of broaching a subject that has been that has been out and about for ages. I'm 69 years old and I have seen and heard everything. And so um, it's something that they really need to um, listen to because it made a lot of good points and I really agreed a lot with um, Pastor, is it Faison? Was that his name, the young man? Okay. Um, it seems like the black church has chosen which sin is the worst. And they talk of, you know, homosexuality is their 
sin of choice. However, the, um, the pastor that said they tolerate it if you're gifted, but it's like sin is sin. It's all unrighteousness. And um, you can't pick one thing over another. So the person that's the habitual liar is just as much as a sinner as the homosexual. And the thing is, Jesus talks about loving your neighbor as you love yourself. You, you love the sinner and you hate the sin. You have a choice. So for anybody to make somebody else's sin worse than their own, and we all have sin, and we all fall short. You know, this, this was such a good movie. I really enjoyed it. And yes, I'm a first lady of the church. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, okay, I see a question from Reverend Eugene Palmore. So um, Eugene, Reverend, let me move you over. Uh oh. Hi, guys. Hey, Reverend. Hello, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Michael and I are fellow um, alums at Union. First of all, I really want to congratulate you on this work. It is powerful. I really think it should be mandatory in seminaries. I really do, because too often men and women go to seminaries thinking that they're going to learn something that confirms who they are, yeah. confirms what they know, rather than tearing them to tear down what they think they know so that they can be that open book. I think it was um, Reverend Dr. Flunder who said that question about who put a back cover on the, um, on the Bible. And so I commend you for this work. I find a lot of times when uh, I've applied for jobs at churches and I'm a straight male who has always tried to understand why people are afraid of love. Mm. Why people are afraid of love in any of its manifestations. And I have lost jobs because I wear an earring. <laughs> people have not hired me because I wear an earring and because they're afraid of what that, that stands for, what they think it stands for. I've been told that, well, if you just lose the earring, I said, why? And then I try to do a history of, of biblical dressing. <laughs> how people dress in first century Palestine, how um, people were received, how the Pharisees dressed, how throughout the history of humanity, the things that people call sinful aren't sin. I, um, particularly this identity that um, same gender loving people are sinners because they are same gender loving people. So my question really was, is how do you explain to your, uh, to anybody, what is the difference between, let me get it so I won't say it wrong. Uh, Cause I wrote it down. I tried to write it down. I'm trying to do a lot of things at one time. What do you tell church folk about the difference between sex, sexuality, and sensuality? Because it seems like church folk conflate the three. They think that sex is the same as sexuality. And particularly when it comes to um, same gender loving people, they cannot seem to separate. So what do you tell Folk, how do, how do you frame your answer so as to speak to a truth that is instructive and not destructive to the body and the spirit? Because too often people want to destroy somebody. Mm. And that seems to be the talk about sin. The sin is not something to overcome. It's something that we use to destroy people. So how do you, your discussions talk about sex, sexuality, and and sensuality, and how do you instruct people about the differences between the two so that it instructs them and not destroys them? Mm. 
Michael Westby. Oh, that's me? <laughs> it's not me. My classmate put me on the spot? No. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I, you know, I think that what happens is that, and I've learned this through, with working with Dr. Mariah Britton. Yes, my. Start with, yes. I know you were surprised. <laughs> oh, I was um, so glad that she was on it. It just made my heart feel so warm because yeah. I worked with her for so long. Right. And she has been, she was one of my main mentors and she taught me so many things. But what she really, what she really did was that she brought this topic, this conversation to, sem to seminary level. And I remember students, when you, when you do that, that sexual biography, where you learn, where you look, because we have to have these, um, we have to have these conversations. And even I have used those tools in my own workshops when I'm talking specifically about human sexuality. I'm like, you brought it to my biography. church in Queens. Yes, you we have biography. Yes, we have. Yeah, we have to have this biography because it really is about. There's a lot of people who don't know it because they weren't introduced to it. There's a lot of people who. There are some people in our in our spaces and places who've been traumatized. So, you know, this avoidance of the conversation is really about avoidance of trauma, mm -hmm. sometimes, for some people, because this topic is very traumatic, whether it was something happened when we were young or something that's still internalized from, previous, from a previous generation. Like, for instance, we, the, there, there was a preacher who talked about the shaming the women, the shaming the young woman in the church. Well, she's internalizing that shame into the right. fetus. So the fetus comes out having this, these issues and this trauma, and it came, it has become intergenerational. So I think is what we're teaching, we're teaching people and bringing these court and bringing these workshops to churches to have these grave conversations because it, the root is they don't know, for instance, people know sex and what that, what that, but they don't know all of it. They just know the action, right. And they don't know what sexuality, what flows, or how you flow and how you operate. It's sex is what I do, sexuality is who I am. And then the sensuality of, of all those things, we get conflated. But I think we really have to have the, the training and have people coming in and have specific workshops to have these conversations where it is open, it is honest, it is trust, trustworthy, and really unpack it and, re, and, and provide a safe space. My, the ministry I work with is Wounded Healers. We, in the closed door, safe space. What goes out does not. What go? What happens in that room stays in that room. If it goes out, we're gonna we're gonna deal with it. Mm -hmm. uh, names are mentioned. We're going. To, we'll tell you if names are mentioned. We're going to deal with it. And well, I, how do we? Well, just one more thing. This conversation. How do we get folk to stop putting God in a box when it comes to sex and sexuality? Because that seems to be the stumbling block for the mm. church, particularly in the black church, where the only thing that matters is, is the issue of hierarchy and power. But they think this thing that God is, is in their box. Mm. Not, they're not in God's box, and God has no box. How do we get folk out of this box? That God is in a box. We have to, we have to unlearn what we know about God. God is way bigger than that box, and we refuse to do it. We, it's not about learning. It's about unlearning. Mm -hmm. And we're still struggling with the fact that we're unlearning about God. We, 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 we're so, you know, and then in, we, in the black church sometimes, and I hate to use this term, we, we sometimes engage in Christian supremacy. Where we yes, think, we do. Yeah, we, we're, it, we're, we're it. And yep. come to, we're trying to find out when you start to open up yourself, you're like, oh, no, we're not it. <laughs> there's, there's other there are some other things going on and i think in and even within the black church there's a you know a lot of people don't know and i and i'm and i'm hitting on it and i'm hitting on this a lot of people don't know that a lot of african spirituality occurs in the church there's a reason why the choir director is who the choir director is not mm -hmm. from any other perspective but from an african lens there's a reason why the choir director is where the choir director is. He's assigned to do spiritually things prior to the opening, prior, if he sings a song prior to the preacher, he's doing what? He's opening up for reception. Yeah. After the preacher preaches, 
the, that that lead choir, that lead singer that they, that Nate was talking about. Yep. What is he doing? He's closing the gateway. That's one is giving the, one is giving, the, one is giving the invocation, and one is giving the benediction. Yes, and that is African spirit. That is not that is not Christian. That is African spirituality under the gaze of Christianity. But okay. we're ha- we're afraid to. Um, we're so afraid and so ignorant and so not ignorant, but so limited because we're so caught up in this, these ideas of who God is, what we have to unlearn. But I, through my work, I really look at that. I looked at that, I was like, wow. I looked at scenario, I looked at the singer and I looked at the preacher, then I looked at the singer again. I was like, oh, I get it. We're just, you know, this is, this is, this ain't church. This is, that, this is the woods. This is the, the, the bush back. This is back in the day when there were certain people who did certain things for gotcha. the community. But I think we have a lot to unlearn. Okay. Lot. I, 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 I want to just just chime in real quick. I'm going to move, move on to the next question, next person. But for me, um, Rev, is that it's hard for unfree people to think freely. Yeah. Yes. The Hebrews in the in the wilderness. <laughs> that's that that's how that's how I see the box of God. When, yeah. people, when people put uh, uh, God in a box or put themselves in a box with God is that you haven't been free enough, deep enough, long enough to understand that there, there is no box. Right. Right. So uh, but, it sounds like it sounds like Neo when he was t- in the in the Matrix. There is no spoon. Right. Right. <laughs> there is no spoon. <laughs> This is a, but anyway, I'm sorry, Alex, we're here. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, my brothers. I really appreciate it. Um, so I wanted to call on um, uh, Reverend Benita Kitt, but she unfortunately isn't here anymore. She did leave a question that I did think was worth uh, just asking out loud. Uh, what would you suggest would be the approach to begin this conversation in a strong social action black church? Oh, for me, it's just the fact that to finally admit that there is an issue. Mm. When you admit that there is an issue, then you can start a conversation. Exactly. But there are many people, not all black people, not all black churches, not all churches, period, that need to have a conversation, an adult conversation, not a Christian conversation, but a human, <laughs> a question of humanity, of what is and what isn't. Just like we need to have this conversation, America needs to have a conversation about racism. But it needs to be a question about what it is to be civilized first. And may we not, uh, we may not have that conversation about racism if we have that answer first about what is to be civilized. And it's the same thing here a little bit. To me, to me. I'm not a theologian. I don't know. I'm just a filmmaker. <laughs> but you're, yeah, but you are a theologian in film. <laughs> you're a theologian in film. There's, a, there's another person, Gina? Yeah, let me, uh, let me invite Gina over. And okay, there we go. Hi, Gina. If you're able to uh, just unmute yourself. Hi, I'm not. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. We, can. Uh, we can hear you. Can you hear us? <laughs> Okay, while Gina's figuring things out, I'm just gonna uh, move our next person over. Um, let me reach out to Liam Lefren. Hey, Liam. Hello. Good to see you. 
Nice to see you too. Um, thank you guys so much for doing this. Uh, the film was incredible and, and super insightful. Uh, my question, um, I guess, is, is for those preachers and priests, um, specifically the ones uh, in the Bible Belt in the South that uh, hold the ideology uh, that, that homosexuality is a sin uh, themselves and, and that preach it in the church, uh, where, where do you think that that belief comes from? Is it just tradition passed on throughout the generations? It's in the book or is it more of a, a deeper internal place of fear? I, I'm curious to hear what both of you think about what uh, motivates that uh, character. I think that for many people, they take the Bible word for word and not looking at the word or the history behind the word or behind the scene or behind the letter uh, or behind the person who wrote it. Um, there, you know, when you, when you mix theology, spirituality, and um, science, you may get different answers. Uh, as you know, you find out that because of science, you found out that this didn't this this particular event didn't happen at this particular time because it was impossible because this was going on in this particular area. So it was maybe like two hundred miles away from what they say where they said it was. You know, this this event happened. So science has proven a lot um, that things may may not happen the way things have happened, the way it was written at that particular time because, um, because of geography and other things that were going on. So I think science is proving a lot of things to be wrong, but a lot of people just, you know, some people just stick, stick with the word and that's the word that they believe in, not looking behind it or doing research or becoming a theologist, period. Some people just become preachers, right. not really learning what the word really meant. And they lay, and then they espouse that stuff to, to to people who don't read. In the congregation, who just believe what they're being told, because that person is of God, they say. But you have to do your own research on everything. And start your own relationship, your own personal relationship, with God. Yahweh, whoever you want to 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 call the entity, it, it's your personal relationship that must be connected for you to know your truth i think michael um as one who has lectured and and um and taught at um, several seminaries and it is generational yes but on on the entire spectrum from pro to con at the end, what is most common denominator, what is most common factor is, it's personal. If a preacher evolves, guarantee you something personal happened that he had to rethink and remit. Yes. If he's totally mm -hmm. against it, so my question is for the even for the for the for the minister where I respect his viewpoint, as every time I see it, I see something I said, it's personal. This is personal. That you right. would sit in this congregation and preach and want to make your LGBT members uncomfortable. That's personal. The other thing I realized is that, and my study, when these preachers preach um, like him to make LGBT people uncomfortable, he is not talking to the adults at all. He is talking to the 12 year olds. The adults are there because they they've heard him, they've heard him several times. The adults still come to the church. They 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 go they leave they still they have their own fortitude. The message is aimed for the twelve year old. So the question becomes, why is that? Important? Because at the end of the day, it's personal, and I've seen it happen. The more I teach this, the more I make people come have come forward. I said, mm, it's personal. Something happened. Something Somebody, happened. some cousin. Yeah. Um, okay, it looks like we have Gina back. Yeah, hi Gina. Hi, uh, and I'm having <laughs> I'm having uh, Wi-Fi issues, but I want to thank both of you 
for bringing this to the black community, but especially the black church community. Um, my mother was a minister before she died last year. And she wasn't a past, she wasn't the pastor of the church. She was a minister and it was amazing how some would say she wasn't as respected as she thought she was, um, being that she was a woman. Um, Reverend, I think her name was Joan Terrell. I, I had written some notes, but I can't pull them up right now. Joanne. I'm sorry, Joanne. I'm sorry, Joanne Terrell. It was amazing and a deep realization that she had to know that if she had stood in the pulpit, no one would have heard her message. Right. And it, but when she was younger, when she was a child, it was okay for her to be up there. But as an adult and an ordained minister, she knew that they wouldn't have heard a thing she said. And it could have been something to save somebody's life that it mattered where she stood. Because she was a woman, it mattered where she stood. And the last thing, it's always amazing, especially in the blood. Please. We're, we're losing your, your audio a little bit. Um, okay. Can you hear me better now? Yes. 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 Okay. It, when they say come as you are, it's come as you are if you're not gay, lesbian, transgender, a prostitute, or, or you're not dressed the way they think you should be, but come as you are. It, 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 it's bullshit. And I've had that conversation with my mom a lot of times when she was alive. Everything is so hypocritical and it shouldn't be that way because allegedly God is there for yeah. Allegedly. <laughs> but I thank, I thank you both. I thank all three of you and especially you, Alex, because I thank you in person for the many things that you, the opportunities that you bring to us. Hopefully back in person sometime soon. Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. Um, so I have two, I actually have two jo Joanne uh, Terrells out there. Uh, I'll just move them both over and uh, maybe the, the link was shared or something, but um, let's see if that works. Wow, you can move me off. Oh. There's Joanne. Hey, Joanne. Hey. hey. <laughs> oh, we don't have your audio connected. Oh, there we go. No. Uh, now you have to unmute. <laughs> unmute. Sorry. Unmute. Unmute. There you go. Thank you, uh, uh, Gina, for that. Um, recognition of, of something that's, that was very important to me at the time that I had realized uh, it was important for me to stand in the space where I was because the actual sermon I was preaching had to do with power and where it's, and the fact that it's found in places that you don't expect to find it. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the fact that I stood there meant uh, that, they actually heard what I said because I, there, is, there are times when we, have a re, we should have a relationship with power that we should be willing to relinquish it in order to uh, actually in, exponentially increase everyone's uh, sense of empowerment. And so that's, that's what I was doing. I mean, I think that's a relationship with power that Jesus always uh, had and that's and and people don't recognize that that it that the scripture is always talking about power it's always talking about power and the right relationship to it and uh i i you know i, I i'm a theologian so i actually know some of the answer to the question that i posed in the chat which is um uh, uh, you know we have a lot of um of uh, of, of misconceptions about St. Augustine. First of all, that he uh, promoted a doctrine of original sin when actually his rhetorical argument is framed in 
the construct of original righteousness, original virtue, but we'd rather focus on original sin rather than original virtue and to uh, rather than cultivate a sense of the sacredness of all of creation, including each other, everything, everything is a proper subject of, of human love for Augustine if we look at it through the lenses of God. And that's what sacramentality is. Why doesn't the church promote that rather than a debased view of humankind? Why do we uh, equate sin with sexual things and not with uh, things pertaining to justice? Why is uh, homelessness not sinful? Why is mass incarceration not sinful? Why is uh, uh, temple prostitution, which we really haven't discussed uh, long enough in this, in this, in this film, or, or in any place at all, we haven't discussed the fact that temple prostitution is a real thing. It's a real thing. Uh, there's so much sexual abuse of women in churches, and it's because we don't cultivate a sense of sacramentality or the sacredness of life, the sacredness of other people, the sacredness of all things created, including our sexuality, uh, uh, whatever uh, gifts we have in that regard, and, and however we decide to cultivate it, uh, you know, through the lenses of the actual sacredness of other beings. So um, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm the, the power of the church to define things for folk leaves me at a loss as to how to really help people to cultivate, where people really go to cultivate that sense of sacramentality. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and I guess I, I find it in nature a lot. I, I find it in uh, discussions such as these that are honest and open and, and, and raw and painful and difficult, but that uh, ultimately uh, can lend to our healing. So I do also thank you, uh, Chan, for this, for the opportunity to, to participate in it, but also for, for uh, continuing to, um, to lift up the both and of the church, the, the both its, uh, both its, um, its, its flawed character and as well its uh, potential for redemption of the community. So thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we pro we should probably go to two last questions. There are, we continue to be getting a lot of questions, uh, as I think was um, uh, very much to be expected. And um, we'll go to Michelle next. And I'll also bring in Eric so that we can just have them both uh, ready to go. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you. Ah, there we go. Thank you so much. Um, it was an excellent um, film and presentation. Congratulations. And thank you so much for um, publishing this. I can't wait for the rest of the world to see it. Uh, my question, I, I come from a very different background. Um, parents originally Baptist in the South, the Bible Belt Line originally. Um, my mother was Seventh-day Adventist. I'm Baptist, baptized as Seventh-day Adventist. My father was Baptist. So we went to church on both days. Um, and I've seen it, everything that you've discussed, <laughs> I've seen all of it, whether it's on the East Coast or the West Coast, and I live in LA. How do you um, suggest broaching the subject with ministers um, not of any particular denomination that are pretty set in their ways, um, but it's important information and dialogue that needs to be had um, in order for the church, all of us to grow um, of any denomination. How do you suggest broaching that? Michael, I... I, I... Well, the United Church of Christ actually has a program called... Um, our whole lives. So they have, and it's, it's a program 
that um, is incremental. Uh, everything is age appropriate. So that's one of the that's one of the um, um, denominations that actually talk have these these these, conver these conversations around uh, human sexuality because um, they believe it is it's about education, it's about unlearning and you know, learning new things about their community. Um, there are you know there are certain denominations like uh, Pentecostal denomination Kojic that was mentioned in the film. No way. <laughs> <laughs> just yes. no way yep. <laughs> um baptist churches are independent so you got to go it, they don't they belong to maybe belong to it's not constructed like kojic and they're not constructed like episcopal they're not constructed like uh, yes. yeah a lot of that. so they're independent so you got to go to one church at a time so one church will evolve but the church the baptist church around the corner is still stuck with you know the shaming young pregnant yes. women so it, it, it's across the board but the most important, the most important thing that I've discovered is where is the place where you would hit across the board of denominations is seminary level. And, ah. I think human, and, and human sexuality, you have your more liberal institutions to have a course, not a required course. All my courses on human sexuality were um, electives, uh, particularly yeah. gender and human and sexuality and gender. They were electives, but because that was my focus. Um, in, in seminary, I took those classes, um, but they're not required. They're not required. And, and even if something as simple as churches, the denominations will cover um, uh, um, a medical plan for sialis, uh, yes, but, but not cover medical plans for things that women need. Right. Right. Understood. So, uh, right. I mean, even those basic conversations, those basic conversations need to take place. Um, but I guess, again, it's really, a, it's, as I've learned, um, there were seminaries who took a chance. But like, again, they've had these, I, all the classes that I've taught, well, the classes that I took in seminary and the classes I've taught in seminary were all elective. It needs to be required, of course, for those who are going in back into the community and the congregation. Because now at least you have the tools. Most preachers in these congregations don't have the tools. So yeah. they're not, if you don't have the tools, if you, if you don't know how to fix a car, why would you go out and fix the car? Right. So you don't have the tool. They don't have the tools. So it is, it is it's, 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 it's important that because we're dealing with people and we're dealing with human relations, that across the board, we're not, we're not, we're not even, even people with, with, um, even, even dealing with the issue of uh, sexuality and disability. Believe it or not, there was a conversation in church. There are some people who thought that deaf people didn't have sex. <laughs> and the deaf girl comes in, she's pregnant, she's married, she's pregnant. And I was like, what? What, y'all? What? <laughs> so it, it becomes that, it really becomes that kind of, that kind of wow. these, these crazy these conversations that take place. And, <laughs> um, but again, we have to have some brave preachers, we have to have some brave congregations and some um, brave seminaries to actually do this kind of work and have these kind of conversations. And to make it require a course, it should be human sexuality across the board should be re required course. Even if you agree or disagree, let them let the students walk away, right. whatever they walk away with, but at least they have the information. Right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. so, um, all right, let's go over to Eric, and uh, this will be the last question. Uh, you do have to unmute yourself. Sorry, Eric, you, you have to unmute yourself. Can't hear you, Eric. Can't hear you. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, my brother Eric. What's up, Chan? How are you, man? Good to see you, man. Good to see you as well. <coughs> hey, very powerful and thought-provoking um, film. I like the open and honest conversation that's going on. Um, you know, there are a couple of things that got touched on. Uh, one of those is that whole thing around self-deception because we keep deceiving ourselves about what we're doing and also learning and unlearning uh, the way we think, right? Shifting the way we think about this whole thing around religion and sexuality. Chan, my question to you though is, if you got the opportunity to go back in time and change one thing 
in your documentary, what would change would you opt for to add in or what would be something that you would want to add at this point in time? If I had to change one thing about my documentary? Yeah, or add something else that you, that you thought about afterwards now that you've kind of like looked at the finished product. <laughs> uh, I probably would have asked for more money to, to have a better production. <laughs> <laughs> Um, because there, there were so many things financially that I couldn't do because I didn't have the money to do. Mm -hmm. um, because there, there are a lot more places I wanted to visit and there are many more people I wanted to, to speak with to get their opinions because of but the lack of funding, I wasn't able to do that. So I had to work with what I had, as we all do, as, as independent mm -hmm. uh, folk who have their own businesses or whatnot. But that was one of the things. Um, if I just had a little bit more money just to, to, to open up the film mm -hmm. a little bit more in terms of its, if it's, of its narrative, its content, I, I would have done that. But for what I've done, I, I just accept for what it is and hopefully that someone will um, be um, opened up yeah. or maybe yield by it or being able to have an honest conversation with themselves first, then go on and have a conversation with their pastor or their, their ministers or their, their, their rabbi or their priest or the first lady or someone be able to open up and have an honest conversation about the healing process. Because yeah. all my films, all I want to do is it's about the healing process. Yeah, I, I see it as very healing. Michael, you, uh, I think one of your friends talked about uh, using it as a tool for seminary. And I, I see it as opening it up as as early as even the Sunday school programs for young kids. I, I, I see this as really a catalyst for deeper conversations at all levels of not only for the pastors being educated, but just the church in general. And I know, Chan, you talked about the barrier is that you may have gotten because of uh, feedback. And this is not an easy subject to broach, right? But I appreciate the diversity of thought and thinking around it. And so thank you very much for um, sharing and bringing this idea to light because we can't keep hiding behind. And I, I keep using the term self-deception. We can't keep deceiving ourselves that everything is smooth and an and, and easy path. And I love that statement about the Bible and the, the back cover. That is absolutely really powerful so well done everyone thank you very much. thank you eric good to see you all. Thanks for, yeah. um so just right before we wrap <clears throat> i wanted to uh read out loud a question from salome mazard uh will the film have a public virtual release if so when and what platforms thank you for the for the uh for the uh question uh right now um we're looking for distribution for the film but the right distribution for the film. Um, we, we put in all of my money <laughs> and, my, and, and my family's a little hot at me right now, but um, daddy had to do what daddy had to do to put the film out and get people healed. Um, we'll, we'll, we're, we're talking to people, one or two people at this particular time about a platform that will, will work, but we believe that this is something that should be not just a domestic but international uh, talk uh, all over the world, uh, in Africa, in, in Europe, and also in the, uh, the islands also, and also in Brazil too. Uh, wherever there is a, um, a church, I think that this is uh, something that needs to be talked about, needs to be seen, and it can be used as a teaching teaching tool also, you know, it can be used as a teaching tool. So um, there also is probably a little um, guide, study guide that will go out with this also in time. So we're working on it. Right. Pray for us. <laughs> I'm so sorry we don't have time for everyone else's questions. Uh, there have just been a lot coming in throughout the night, but I really wanted to thank everyone who did ask a question whether or not we were able to call on you. And of course, a huge thank you to both of you, Reverend Dr. Michael Elam, Chan, 
always an honor to have you with us and to have you share your work with us. So thank you both. And thank you. Thank you. I hope we can sleep better. <laughs> we were yes. talking earlier about that. Yes, yes, yes. So once again, Alex, thank you and the Cinema School at USC. And my brother, uh, Michael, thank you for, for being there, for the love, for the intellect, for the brotherhood, and just for the good person and the good man that you are. And, and my friend. So thank you. And thank you for everybody for watching. Yeah, and thank let's, you. Let's, yes, let's, let's move this thing forward and get this thing out. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good God night. bless. Take care. God bless.